Hello, it's Patrick Inhofer with MixingLight.com, and I am at the worldwide headquarters of Flanders Scientific yep. here with uh, CEO Bram Desmit. And uh, we're here to talk about something very, very exciting, which is quantum dots. That's correct, yeah. Quantum yeah. dots are in the house, they're yeah. a real thing. <laughs> And uh, I'm looking at them right now, and this is a brand new display that you are unveiling uh, in the coming days from the time of this recording. Yep. And so you invited me up here to Atlanta, yep. and uh, I've gotten my eyes on this thing, and I have to say, it's super impressive. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and this is a reference display that we're talking about. Absolutely. Correct? Thanks for coming out and taking a look. Uh, Patrick got eyes on this just about before anybody. And um, so this is going to be our XMP550, uh, which is a new uh, 55 inch HDR mastering monitor that uh, we've developed. Uh, and this uses a quantum dot OLED uh, display. What really makes this special is that we're kind of getting over this uh, situation of having small reference monitors and then large client monitors that maybe aren't quite reference quality. This really is intended as something that can serve as a primary grading display uh, and also is big enough for the client to see. So highlights of the display. Um, it can do 2000 nits peak luminance, so it can definitely be used for those 1000 nit HDR masters without a problem. Um, and it is a truly additive system. So it's red, green, blue, additive for white, which means no volumetric collapse, no volumetric limitations like you might have with WOLED displays. And also it's a lot brighter than a lot of the other RGB OLED technologies out there. So as opposed to something that's maybe capped at 500 or 700 nits, again, this can do 2000 nits peak. And again, full color volume, no volumetric collapse. That means you get bright reds, bright greens, bright blues. You don't get any of that color volume um, collapse that you might get on other technologies. And now the color volume collapse, and this is really important, and that I honestly think that that's really one of the most important, yeah. impressive things that I see about this display. So basically you have uh, on, for example, some of the previous brighter um, uh, OLED technologies were a, as you said, WRGB system. So they essentially used a white subpixel as a boost. So you could do white as bright as you wanted to. You could do white at, for example, a thousand nits without a problem. Uh, but the problem is that in a system that is color accurate, when you're doing a thousand nits for white, you maybe should be able to do 600, 700 nits for green. And instead you might have been doing two or 300 nits for green. And of course there's this interplay between brightness and saturation. So it also just looks more desaturated um, with that luminance drop. Uh, so I think a lot of people will be kind of surprised when they look at some of maybe the previous content. If you've graded SDR on a WOLED, no problem. But if you try to grade HDR without referencing a smaller uh, truly additive uh, reference display in the past, you may notice that you know, some of the saturation that uh, was missing on your previous display will now be visible on this display. So again, this kind of sets a new, new benchmark in terms of uh, something that's big enough for everybody to look at, but also is going to match or even exceed the capabilities of some of the smaller reference monitors that people have been using in the past. Um, so UHD resolution, um, and um, again, reference grade uh, color performance. Um, and one of the other beautiful things about it is that the off-access viewing is just phenomenal. So uh, not only is it large enough for your clients to see, but we were talking about this too, like your clients can now actually sit off-access from you and be looking at the same, same image. Um, everybody here, yeah, when we first got the display into test with, it was kind of joking that you finally lose the image when you're standing behind the monitor. Uh, <laughs> but from the side, there's really very little color shift, very little luminance drop. Even at a 60 degree angle, you're still maintaining uh, over 80% of the same luminance that you would have on access uh, compared to some other technologies where you might have 55% or less of that luminance off access at 60 degrees. So really phenomenal in that respect and also very minimal color shift off access uh, gives people the flexibility to sit anywhere in the room and be looking at the same image uh, without having to you know, sit over the colorist's shoulder to make, make sure you're seeing the same thing. I would often have directors where they'd be like, they'd move their chair to be directly middle. Yeah. And then people would like stand behind them to kind yeah. of, you know, exactly. you get that type of behavior yeah. going on in the grading suite. And that's 
pretty much eliminated here. Yeah. What about up, down? Yeah, vertical, same thing. You can really sit high, low, doesn't matter if you want to mount it on a wall. Um, you have people sitting, you know, in a theater type setup where maybe they're, the clients are sitting on a platform that's higher than you or lower than you, um, still looking at the same image off access. It uh, doesn't really matter uh, to the side, up, down. Um, so again, a, a lot more flexibility. I think it's gonna change what people can do in their rooms um, and uh, also give people the flexibility to, if they want to, run single monitor rooms now. Um, whereas before, that was always a challenge because a lot of the big displays weren't really quite up to the task of at least the HDR mastering portion, whereas this can be used for that. Um, and also, again, uh, 31 is hard to have everybody look at this at the same time. Yeah, but at, at 55, you really can do that. So, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's very exciting technology. Uh, I've been doing this since 2005 in the display industry, and uh, this is probably the most excited I've been about a display in quite some time uh, because it really is impressive on all counts. All right, let's talk the nitty gritty here. Yeah. From delivery. Yeah. <laughs> and pricing. Like, yeah. when's it available? <laughs> How much is it going to cost yeah. us? Yeah, so we're hopefully going to get these uh, shipping in August or September. That's our goal anyway. Um, but uh, we're well on track for that right now. Uh, we've have a couple prototypes already built, so we're we're well on our way to to getting all that done. Um, just waiting on delivery of more panels to us, and then we'll start shipping them out to customers. And uh, in terms of price, uh, target price is uh, $19,995, trying to keep it under $20,000. So broke the 20K barrier. We're trying really hard to do that. Uh, we think that it's important to make HDR mastering monitors at least a little bit more affordable. Um, we're trying to get away from this $35,000 to $55,000 price points we've been living with in the past. Um, because if we want to see a lot more HDR content, then the displays for this mastering of, of that HDR content have got to become more affordable. So we're doing what we can on our end to, to make that possible. You still get all the professional connectivity, of course, 12 gigabit a second SDI, you can do quad 3G, you can do double six, you can do single 12G, 444 RGB, 12 bit, 10 bit signals, no problem. Um, it does all those things. And then, uh, yeah, it'll have our volumetric autocal uh, like we do on our DM series monitors as well. So be able to plug a probe directly into it for a full autocal of the display for all color space targets, all EOTF targets. And it is essentially a true volumetric autocal. So we're not just doing a white balance only adjustment. Um, we are essentially profiling the native behavior of the display. Uh, and then what we do is we store that information on the display and then we build LUTs on the fly for whatever target color space you might uh, need to do. Anybody who has any of our DM series monitors currently is probably familiar with that process now. It's really simplified calibration. Um, you get accurate results without having to be an expert, without having to pull out software uh, to do it. You just plug the probe directly in, hit a few buttons, and it runs through the process in a very automated way. And again, gives you the flexibility of not only calibrating for one color space uh, setup, but for all possible selections on the monitor. The really great thing about it too is that calculation, you only have to do that at one time and then it saves it to memory. And so you don't have to recalculate that LUT until the next time you run a native profile on the monitor. Um, so the reason we don't calculate it ahead of time for all possible combinations is because there are thousands of them yeah. uh, and we don't want to waste your time. If you, if you don't need P3 with gamma 2.0 and 9300K, white balance, then we don't want to waste your time and make a LUT for that. But if you need that crazy combination for whatever reason, no problem, select those things in the menu, boom, you'll get a LUT generated, safe to the display uh, to accurately give you that color rendition on screen. Let's talk a little bit about technology now. Sure. Um, so this is 55 inches. Correct. So that's where the XMP550 comes Correct. from. Yep. And uh, what are the chances that we're going to get scaled down versions of this? Because all of this is all its technology is built on consumer displays. Yeah, yeah. And so it's up to uh, these billion dollar, <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. producers that have these huge factories to decide to cut down yeah. to 32 inches, right? Yeah, so the beautiful thing about uh, quantum dot OLED technology is it is very scalable. So, um, you know, uh, 77 all the way down to uh, one day, maybe 27 or smaller uh, should in theory be possible. Um, it is uh, imminently more scalable than a lot of other technologies. Uh, so starting with 55, um, that is the size that was available and met the performance benchmarks that we were looking at. Um, but we do have high hopes that it can be scaled to other sizes. We're not locked into uh, in the future just uh, looking at one size. So um, very, very scalable. 
Um, you know, can't make any promises about exact things that might, might or might not be coming, yeah. uh, but we certainly are encouraging the panel manufacturer um, to uh, look into those different sizes, again, meeting the performance benchmarks and the criteria that we're looking for, things like, uh, you know, UHD resolution, at least a thousand nits, um, wide color gamut, uh, but it is, uh, at least in theory, possible. Yeah. Do you think we will actually ever we will break that ten thousand dollar <laughs> thirty one inch price for a thirty one inch display. We can break that, that price point. It remains to be seen. We'll 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 see if it's possible. But um, it's um, yeah. I, I think that that's not out of the realm of possibility. But we'll we'll have to see um, how things develop. You know, some of those things like what what we get charged for panels are beyond our control. Yeah, of uh, course. But uh, I think we've already seen a lot of positive you know, uh, kind of movement on that in this respect in that, you know, if you had told me two years ago, hey, Brown, one day you'll be selling a sub $20,000, 55-inch, 2,000-nit HDR mastering monitor, I would have said, you're crazy, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's happening, and uh, I think that there's a, a lot of room for pricing to continue to kind of uh, improve over time, as, as it typically does as technologies mature. So um, I have high hopes that uh, we'll get to more and more attainable price points for people. Quantum dot. Yeah. I, I have to ask you because I, I'm very like, like the term AI, right? It <laughs> drives me insane. Yeah. Right. If you read my Sunday newsletter, yeah. I rail on it at least yeah. once or twice a month because, yeah. you know, everyone calls everything AI. It's not AI. Yeah. It's machine learning. It's <laughs> not AI. It's not yeah. intelligent. Yeah. Quantum dot. Is this like? actual quantum physics or is this a marketing term? No, I mean, they're, they, they are actual quantum dots. Uh, and so what ends up happening on this technology is that uh, the baseline is a blue electroluminescent layer. Um, so it's a self-emitting per pixel technology. Um, and then what you end up having happen is the blue actually passes through unfiltered. So your blue light output is just the blue OLED material. Uh, but then the blue light actually goes through a, a green and a red quantum dot conversion layer. So it hits that layer and it actually converts that light from blue to green or from blue to red. Um, one of the beautiful things about that is you get um, kind of uh, more even aging over time, uh, more stability over time because you're starting at the same um, uh, blue OLED material. You don't have differential aging in the OLED material with red OLED, green OLED, blue OLED. Um, so uh, starting with the same baseline really helps in that respect. Uh, longevity is really great on these because of that. Um, and also it's a top emission technology, which is what gives us some of those benefits of that great off-axis viewing. And also just being able to hit those high knit um, uh, kind of values on the output of the display. So, One of the things that I find interesting about all of this is when you compare the different technologies mm -hmm. that we've been using over the past yeah. couple of years. Of course, you know, nowadays on Mixing Light, in fact, probably just recently on an Office Hours, we talked about, all right, if you need something that's kind of reference-like, yeah. uh, but you can't put down $30,000 sure. for a display, maybe like the, the whatever it is, the 12-inch iPad Pro yeah. or something uh -huh. like that, yeah. right? It, it, the color imagery comes out pretty yeah. solid right yeah. from the factory. Uh, it's got really high nit values. Yeah. And it's something that, um, you know, we're like, it's not reference mastering, yeah. but it's a target you can at least look at. And sure. you know that that's what people are looking at, but yeah. it doesn't really show you the ones and zeros. Yeah, there's right? some limitations there. And we, we were looking at that earlier um, because we had a, um, actually the, the laptop here uses a full array local dimming backlight as well. And some of these shots in particular, we were looking at some of these like details around headlights and small lights. And with a lot of the full array local dimming, you'll get those things blown out. You lose all the highlight detail. Um, there's a shot in this demo reel we were looking at where there was a corner of a kiosk that had all this detail around bright lights. Um, and on the full array local dimming, when we compare the same image, you just saw a white blob. There's yeah, no, it's just, no detail. It's just a, there's nothing there. It's just pure yeah. white. It's it almost looks like it's clipped out. Yeah. But it's not clipped. It's no. A, it's it's a just it's actually like a blooming of the full array local dimming. So there, there's enough bright lights there that is trying to achieve that peak, and it's kind of just washing out the detail that's around. So around does, those bright it, does lights. it can't like resolve the fine detail? Yeah. Basically, the detail is higher the resolution than the actual full array local dimming backlight is. Right. Uh, whereas here you have per pixel level control which means that you can have much darker areas next to very bright areas and you can actually resolve that detail correctly. Um, so 
has a lot of advantages there. Again, in similar to what we were talking about with the color volume reproduction, um, what you see here is what, what you really have. Um, so you, you see the accurate color, but you also see the accurate detail on a per pixel level. Um, you also, because it's not full array local dimming, you don't have to worry about those motion artifacts uh, in addition to the concerns about small bright objects, halation, um, those types of issues. So it solves a lot of those problems for people. Again, uh, we, we feel that it's a, a truly reference grade image. Um, that solves a lot of these kind of limitations of other HDR technologies. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground here on this display. Did I miss anything? Is there anything I should have asked you? That... Uh, there, there are a few things that I think are, are nice highlights. Uh, you know, we've sold um, W OLEDs, we've sold RGB OLEDs, we've sold full array local dimming, we've sold static backlight. So we're familiar with all the different display technologies, right? Um, and each one has kind of pros and cons. Some of the things that I think are highlights of this are, uh, one is um, longevity of the product. So these OLED materials last a lot longer than previous generations. Um, so this is a product that should serve people well for quite a while. Similarly, um, because this has 2000 nit peak, we understand most people are grading at 1000 nit and that's how most deliverables are still going out. If you want to do a 2000 nit grade and deliverable, you could do that. But more importantly as well, you get so much headroom. So, you know, a lot of these other display technologies go out to market, maybe it'll do a thousand nits when it's brand new, even six months down the road, you're not quite hitting a thousand nits anymore. Here, you've got so much headroom that, you know, two, three, four years down the road, not a problem, still hitting at least, you know, well over a thousand nits. So you're not gonna slip below that kind of threshold. Um, the other nice thing with this is that the um, power efficiency is actually quite good as well compared to a lot of other HDR technologies, especially ones that can get this bright. Um, so we, uh, we were rating the power consumption on this somewhere in, you know, depending on the content, because it is very content dependent, but we're seeing ranges of 75 watts to 325 watts is mm -hmm. about the maximum draw that we've seen. A lot of other technologies that can get to a thousand nits plus are drawing way more power than that, um, especially when we start getting to this sort of size. So this is as power efficient as a lot of the 31 inch monitors, uh, even though it's a much, much larger display. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I think is quite phenomenal is the uniformity on these. So that's always been a big complaint with that, some other OLED technologies. We pulled, up, we pulled up some full field. And that's good. And yeah. it's... <laughs> It's remarkable. It really is yeah. remarkable. It's always hard to get uniformity great on large panels. Yeah. Um, but this has done uh, about as good a job as I've ever seen on something of this size. So yeah, you actually, I found my, my eyes were playing tricks on me. It was so yeah, smooth. Yeah, it's more like, hey, is this my, monitor reflecting on yeah, it? Or, it's like yeah, your eyes, exactly. you start seeing like dots and yeah. things like that. Yeah. It's just your eyes are I'm not familiar, used to seeing something yeah. quite as auto-generated. Yeah, so it's, clean. it's very clean looking and... Uh, yeah, so it's uh, it, it's also not very reflective, which is nice. So you still get like yeah. nice, deep, glossy looking blacks. But at the same time, like, you know, if you have light shining off the colorist because there's a bright object in one corner, you really don't see the colorist, you know, being reflected back uh, like it's a mirror like you do on some other display. So low reflectance on these uh, makes them, I think, particularly well suited for the grading suite as well. I'm curious, though, <clears throat> on the um, Quantum Dot OLED, sure. in terms of maximum brightness values, in terms of going forward in the future, mm -hmm. we're at 2,000 nits right now. Is the is there a, a kind of a top, you so know, I think that, level that OLED is just natural to OLED will never get above that? So or? I I I have <laughs> I've become a lot more optimistic on uh, on these things. Um, you know, it used to be that getting even to a thousand nits on an OLED just seemed so bonkers, and then we got displays that went to a thousand nits, and now here we are. Uh, just a few years later at 2,000 nits. So I think that there is a lot of room to to improve, and I wouldn't put it past anybody to develop OLED materials that can get even brighter. Um, I mean, the generation one of this same panel was only doing about 1,500 nits, and now here we are on the generation two, and it's already doing 2,000 nits. So, you know, I can't speculate. I'm not the panel manufacturer, and uh, I, while I'm a in love with the technology and read up about OLED materials a lot. That's <laughs> not, no, yeah. OLED material development is not my expertise, um, but I do not put it past these companies to be able to uh, get these things brighter and brighter. Yeah, I gotta say um, my general perception now that we've kind of talked about all yeah. of this, uh, my kind of takeaway from looking at this is I'm seeing colors. Uh, first of all, your demo material is fantastic <laughs> and it really does allow you to see it, colors you 
I haven't seen on a <laughs> exactly. display. I mean, I, I just, yeah. I haven't seen them. Yeah. And especially when you start getting into the primaries and the bright primaries. Yeah. The other thing too, especially when we were, we were kind of dissecting um, the local array dimming yeah. in the highlights, the detail in the highlights yeah, is brilliant. Even when there's color in there, uh, you can have very rich colors with lots of detail and it doesn't look, it looks weird. It does look a little weird because you haven't seen it, right? <laughs> exactly. But it's weird for yeah. a television, yeah. right? And that's what makes it weird. It's yeah. just you've never seen a medium be quite that yeah. uh, bright and colorful. My prediction is the consumer version of this panel is going to end up in museums all over the world. <laughs> um, and if you're looking for business opportunity, then uh, museums feeding this content into museums. Yeah, it's yeah, you know. it's quite, quite something. And uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, Again, you don't have to use that wider palette, right? But yep. to have it there, I think is important. And also because on some of these other and technologies, some of these things have that white palette, that do. wider palette. They you do. Know, it's natural, especially the nature stuff. Yeah. And, and if you have something that has like volumetric collapse or other issues, the problem is you may be pushing things that the display is artificially limiting. And then when you do finally get it on display like this, you're like, oh, I overcooked that. And if you've never seen it because the display was doing something that was, you know, incorrect essentially. Um, that can be problematic, and this display solves that problem. And you know, this is this gets us in, to wrap up this whole conversation. I'll just kind of finish yeah. with this thought for our members. You know, on mixing light, uh, a lot of the questions that we field have to do with, well, do I really need a reference display if my clients are watching, if my audience is watching on YouTube? Yeah or on, a, on an LCD display, or they're watching at home on an OLED that's yes. a tenth of the price? And the answer is, you do, if you're gonna charge for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, you're gonna, if people are gonna pay you for it. Because the ones and zeros, the data that's on, of these images that lives on our computers has meaning. There's meaning in, in the color that information it contains, and the brightness information it contains. And what you want is a display that can accurately reproduce the ones and zeros on the hard drive. Yeah. And even to this day, we are still um, compromising, especially with the, the advent of HDR yep. and PQ yep. and Rec 2020, yep. where we have now have standards that are designed to exceed uh, our physical capabilities of reproducing this. They yeah. did this on purpose to give us room to grow. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And so now it really is, if you want longevity and uh, into your, into, into the work that you're doing to be able to call it up five years later and not feel embarrassed, like <laughs> what the heck was I doing? We have yeah. to remaster this, yeah. right? There's gonna be a lot of remastering going on yeah. as Technologies like this uh, get more widespread, sure. more developed, more mature, and at price points where more and more people can finally uh, start implementing Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Brom. Thank you. It's always I appreciate a pleasure for to coming come out, out yeah. and hang out with you and uh, get this look at a brand new display, brand new technology, Quantum Dot. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, you can't see it from where you're sitting. <laughs> This is remarkable what I'm seeing. And then these laser lights. I mean, the whole thing is just remarkable. So we couldn't have planned that better. Yeah, thank you, um, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> so for mixinglight.com, I'm Patrick Inhofer. I'm here with Brom Desmond, CEO of Flanders Scientific. And we've been talking about the FSI XMP550 Quantum Dot OLED.